We are on the eve of the 2015 British Chess Championships, which are to be held at Warwick University. Hello, I'm International Master Andrew Martin, and assisting me with the live commentary this year will be Ravi Kumar, an International Master from India. And we'll be giving you live updates and commentary on the English Chess Federation YouTube channel. So do bookmark that channel for the next two weeks. What I thought I'd like to do to whet your appetite for this event would be to show you a whole series of British Championship shockers. Games where an unexpected turn of events took place. And the first of these games comes from the tremendously strong event that was held in Swansea in 1987. Backed by generous sponsorship, many of our strongest players flocked to play in the championship itself. And our featured game is the one between Nigel Short playing white and Jonathan Spielman playing with the black pieces, two of the strongest ever English chess players. Short opened with 1e4 and Spielman fearlessly responded with the modern defence. To Nigel, this is hold, like holding a red rag out to a bull. It's inviting him to attack and he sets out his stall by playing bishop e3. Whereupon Spielman played a6. And of course, we know this position today. It's very, very common if the modern defence actually appears on the board. Very popular system for white bishop e3, very straightforward. And a6 is thought to be uh, the best move even today. And the idea of it is that black retains options with his c-pawn. He wants to expand on the queen side. And part of that plan will be to play b5 and hopefully in turn c5 in one move producing a kind of what black hopes will be an improved dragon formation anyway short restrained black on the queen side with a4 and so spielman just brought his knight out there are certainly ideas of knight g4 in the position so white again played a, a solid move here h3 and after b6 the knight came out to f3. And I believe this setup is known as the Spassky system. It certainly has um, all the hallmark of Spassky about it. White develops sensibly, centralises his minor pieces, and just restrains black with the help of moves like a4 and h3. Quite a good way to play with, um, with white. You know, black has to struggle to equalise. Anyway, Spielman castled. And Nigel brought his bishop out to c4. So again, it's very direct play by white. And again, very straightforward. And black played knight c6. Very much in Spielman's provocative style. Now, if we're looking for improvements on, um, on black's play, perhaps it's time to consider here the move e6. Just trying to blank out this bishop on c4. White doesn't have any decisive pawn advances in the center to exploit his leading development. And so e6 to me looks like a sensible move. The problem with knight c6 is that it is encouraging white to push forward his central pawns. And to attack, Nigel needs no second invitation. So he moves in with e5. And I think this is a pretty strong move in this position. Spielman drops back. Problem with d takes e5 is it opens up the game. And after d takes e5, it's starting to get difficult for black to find good moves. There are all sorts of tactical opportunities for white in this position, based around the move e6. There's an unprotected knight on c6. This position is uncomfortable for black. So Spielman drops away with knight e8, forcing white to think about the pawn. And Nigel defends the pawn with bishop f4. And here, I think Spielman misses his best chance. He continues in the same outlandish mode by playing his knight to a5. But you have to say that move looks dubious. What should black play? Well, I think he should probably take on e5. And after d takes e5, play the non-stereotype move, bishop to e6. This looks weak because white can take the bishop. But black recaptures, and surprisingly, the double pawns are not that easy to get at. Moreover, black attacks the bishop on f4, and if bishop g3, the idea is to bring the rook to f5. Again, very unstereotyped. This is what you have to be when you play the modern defence, and black's got some counterplay against the pawn at e5. 
going back to the game, this knight a5 move looks fishy. Nigel just keeps his bishop on the strong diagonal. And now Spielman strikes out with c5. But I think this is opening up the position perhaps a little too soon. Probably white should castle here, but instead Nigel opens up the game. We can't blame him for that. But I think Spielman gets back into the game now by playing knight takes d6. So perhaps slightly nervy play by both players uh, at this stage of proceedings. Anyway, Nigel moves in with knight to d5. And around here, I think Spielman becomes intimidated and makes a serious mistake. What he should play is simply bishop b7. Just getting the pieces out. If queen e2, then just knight f5. And I don't think there's any way for white to take tactical opportunity here of the move bishop c7, because now we have queen d7. Black's also got counterplay against the knight at d5. That's the idea of this position. So if white takes on a5, we just take on d5. And um, I don't think there's any profit to be made uh, of the pin, for instance, after rook d1 here, of the bishop. Well, I mean, black could simply take on f3 if he wanted to. And then a4 would be hanging. Of course, all this is, is quite difficult to see when you're playing a very tense game. But the move e6 is most unspielman like In one move, black's position collapses. And after bishop takes d6, unfortunately, black had nothing better than to resign this game because white is winning material. Well, this game took place in round nine. And in 1987, actually, Nigel Short went on to win the championship very con uh, convincingly with a score of nine and a half out of 11. Second equal were Conquest and Igor Ivanov. These were the days when players like Ivanov could play in the championship. And fourth equal were Danny King and Jim Plaskett. On seven points, Mickey Adams, Joe Gallagher, John Mestel, Craig Pritchett, Pete Wells and Jonathan Spielman gives you a flavour of just how strong this 1987 championship was. But I repeat, you wouldn't be expecting Spielman to collapse in this manner. Well, now we move on. I uh, apologise for the uh, chess-based icons at the bottom of the screen. But now we go all the way back to 1910. And the British Chess Championship Playoff, BCF Championship as it was known in those days, between Joseph Blake, never heard of him, and H.E. Atkins one of the most famous of British players. And I think when we look at this game, we see how much chess has improved at the highest level in the inter interim period. Because, well, the opening was pretty old fashioned, the Vienna Gambit, and the way White plays in this game is not really befitting of a British championship contender. Let's not forget, forget these guys were playing off for the title. Nevertheless, it does make for high entertainment as after knight takes e4, Blake plays Spielman's move, queen to f3. And I still maintain this is a pretty good move to play at club level, because it could easily catch your opponent on the nose. At the highest level, however, queen f3 can be seen as an inferior cousin to just simply knight to f3. But queen f3, okay. In those days, no databases, very little theory, the players are on their own. Atkins responds with the principal move, f5. And Blake played knight to h3. Well, having blocked in his knight by playing queen f3, you've got to find a location for it. And after knight c6, I get the impression white was waiting for that move. He plays bishop b5. So the success of black's opening really hinges upon his structure in the centre. You've got this strong knight on e4 which more or less can't be exchanged. And you've got these two pawns I, I, uh, itemised in yellow, which are backing up the knight. So can white undermine that structure? Atkins says no, and moves in with queen to h4 check, a move which highlights the poor position of the knight on h3. Obviously g3 hangs the knight. So white has to play king f1. Bishop c5. Curiously, this was a position which was um, being 
discussed at the time. Is this advantageous to black or not? I know with white, I'd feel a little bit uncomfortable with this position with my king on f1. I, still, I prefer black simply because he's able to castle. And in fact, in the game Blackburn versus Mason, which was played in Belfast, 1892, white played knight takes d5, black castled, bishop takes c6, b takes c6, and I think black is much better in this position. Actually, white went on to win this game incredibly, but uh, I really don't like white's position here, as his king is in a compromised state. Coming back to the game Blake versus Atkins, I mean, probably white's best move in this position is to play queen f4. Just bite the bullet, exchange the queens, and try and, try and downgrade the black attack. If black wants anything, he may have to retreat his queen, and then we just go takes on c6 and d3. I think this is the best way for white to uh, minimise his disadvantage. But in the game Blake versus Atkins, white just invites trouble by playing d3, a move which black can ignore, and Atkins castles on the king side. Well, white can't take that knight. He's just set up for disaster along the f file. He takes on c6 instead, and brings his knight back to e2. g5, very, very principled move. d4 by white, and now black plays f4, a very, very good move, getting the pieces completely coordinated for the attack against the white king. Probably white was hoping for a move like g4 here. Uh, I think that's the wrong way to do it, though, because queen f4, the pin is slowing down black's attack. But f4 in the game, very good. Um, the point of it is if white takes on c5, we go bishop g4. And if queen d3, just f3, bulldozing through. And I don't think white can recover from this attack. So Blake in the game played knight h takes f4. Bishop g4 anyway, white's in a terrible mess on the f file. Queen to e3, and now g takes f4, knight takes f4, and a very devastating move, rook takes f4, queen takes f4, rook f8, and white decided to resign. A finishing position which highlights the difficulties that white can face if we go back to the opening if he plays a move like queen f3. Sometimes the initiative in this sort of position can really rebound. Well, moving on, what do we have next? We go to the 1996 British Championship, which was held in Nottingham. And a game between the eventual winner, Grandmaster Chris Ward, and Grandmaster Aaron Summerscale playing with the black pieces. And again, you wouldn't expect a game between these two players to be uh, a short, brutty, brutal and nasty. But in fact, this is exactly what happens in this particular encounter. The scene is set in a Slav defence of the Queen's Gambit, with White playing the sharp move, Knight c3. Sometimes I think uh, players underestimate the different variations that black can play in the Slav, particularly after knight c3, and Summerscale decides to sharpen things up by playing the immediate capture on c4 and then b5. He knows he's running a risk, but he wants to win the game, and this is one interesting way to try to do it. Just take the pawn, threaten to hold on to it, force white to disturb the position early, and then move forward with moves like b4 and then bishop a6. Ward played knight f3, and black continued his disruptive tactics by playing knight to f6. And e5 was answered by knight d5. I mean, just dropping back one move, you have to ask yourself, is there another move apart from e5? Seems to be white's going into action a little bit too early, or he's being encouraged to. But the threat to the pawn here is real, and um, I'm not so sure that um, white does have better. Perhaps queen c2, I mean that looks like a, a decent alternative, but let's not forget when white takes twice on, on c4, the e4 pawn is still hanging. At any rate, Ward is happy to be provoked, and he allows the black knight to come into d5. And now just to show that Chris is intending attack himself, 
he plays his knight to g5. Of course, moves like e6 that are very much on white's mind here. That must be an alternative here. Just to mess up black's position after f takes e6. But if you play this way, there's no plan B. And white would have to be very sure of the attack before he went in for something as committal as this. Especially in a big game. So going back, Ward plays knight g5, setting up the idea of e6. Summerscale plays h6, continuing with the provocation. I mean, well, I think if I was black here, I would have exercised a bit more caution than that and perhaps played e6 myself. But h6, well, it's bound to be entertaining now. Ward continues with the aggression and sticks his queen out on h5. Well, I'll ask you, what would you do with black in this position? Perhaps you'd like to stop the video here and, and contemplate that point because it is quite an interesting situation. Okay, coming back to the game. I think objectively best for black now is just g6. Queen h3 and then probably bishop g7. Just threatening to take that knight off. Calm play by black, consolidation consolidation and white's got to move the knight after which his development looks a little bit shaky but in the game this is just how can i put it life or death in the opening summer scale continues to fight for the initiative here by taking on g5 a cold-blooded exchange sacrifice he wants to take the initiative he wants to show his boss in this opening and he comes in with knight to f4 and of course, white's got to be incredibly careful in this particular situation. King stuck in the middle. It won't be a. It, it's going to be an awful long time before he ever gets to use that extra exchange. Meanwhile, black's putting pressure on that pawn at d4. So that's why Chris protects it with bishop e3. But now another very powerful centralization here, queen to d5. And frankly, I prefer black in this position. Well, white played f3. Black certainly threatening to hoover that pawn off on g2. But now I think Black misses a golden opportunity here to, um, if not win the game, certainly demonstrate who has the upper hand. He played knight e6. I don't like that because it's going backwards. What he should go here is with c5, smashing up the centre. I don't see how White can... Uh, defend comfortably against that for instance if he goes knight to d2 just trying to get the pieces out we take the pawn in the center he takes on f4 we recapture well white's in a hell of a mess with those massive central pawns the black has and going back to c5 if you think about it what is he going to play if he takes on c5 here we take on e5 again there are so many weaknesses in in white's camp that it seems impossible for him to recover so that's how close I think Aaron came to winning this game in the very opening. Instead, after knight e6, white had a little bit of time to play with. He played knight d2, black took on d4, that was obviously intention. But now a stunner, white castles on the queen side. Very surprising position. An awful lot going on here. And um, whilst I still like black's position... Um, it's much more messy than it was before. Anyway, the complications continue with white still under the cosh after c3. He plays knight c4, opening up the attack on the knight at d4. And now, rather horribly, black misses the move c5. Which again would have given him a very good position. I mean, I, I really don't like white's shaky king here. Instead, Aaron took on c4. Chris took with the rook, losing no time. Queen takes e5, missing the whole point of the position. And now another stunner. Queen takes f8 check. Well, obviously, black have missed that move. And it's a complete crusher, as after king takes f8, rook d8 is a sudden checkmate. Well, after this round, after this game in round six, Chris Ward had five out and a half out of six, and he went on to win the tournament. He could not have expected a turn of events so sudden and so brutal. Which brings us to our final game in this little video, and it comes from 1974. 
between Bill Harston playing with the white pieces and Mike Basman playing with black. Just to refresh your memory, in 1974, I think the event was held in Clacton, and there was, um, was it Clacton, or was that the year before? Anyway, there was a playoff at this event, which I believe was held at a hotel near Heathrow, and there was a match, a six-game six match, I think, be between Hartston and Basman, and this game really reflects the style of both players. Harston played d3. He must have known at that time all that he needed to do was to play very sound and orthodox moves and wait for Basman to complicate with some of his weird and wonderful ideas. And sure enough, Black obliges early on by playing knight to a6. This can't be a good move, but it's right up Mike Basman's street. It's not a bad move, but uh, it just can't be best. Basman is happy to experiment in every way in the opening of the game and uh, the complications continue with bishop to f5 and then queen to d7. So white is playing a kind of king's in attack. Black, no idea what he's playing. Is it a kind of reverse London system? Uh, is it an opening with no name? Is it the Basman defence? We just don't know. Anyway, seeing bishop h3 coming up, I'm sure that's black's idea, Hartson decides to play in the centre. I like this game because it's a real game of chess, you know, there's hardly any theory at all. The two players are playing on their own right from the start, and this makes for a highly entertaining struggle. With Basman trying all the ways he knows to complicate the game using bizarre methods. And after castles, black played g5. Well, we all know Mike Basman is partial to this move. He likes it with white, the grob. He likes it with black, the borg, as he's christened it. Um... Here g5 simply can't be good. I'm sorry, this, this cannot be any good. There's no way that black's going to mate white in this position. And if he doesn't mate white, the move g5 looks like an extravagance. Especially when, for instance, a move like e5 is available. I don't know why you would ever reject that move. But Mike goes his own way all the time. g5 is right up his street. So naturally, again, Hartston reacts classically in the centre. By the way, I think Bill Hartston won this playoff. Four and a half, one and a half. Just by playing orthodox moves. So black drops his bishop back. White brings the bishop out. And now black continues with his premature advance. H5. Of course this makes for highly interesting chess. But we do wonder where black is going to put his king. Knight d4 was answered by bishop h3. And now white played bishop takes h3. A cold blooded move. Just saying to black. There's no way you're going to mate me. In this position. Now comes b4. Well, uh, of course, this is a, a very interesting situation. It's interesting as well that white rejects the opportunity of playing queen to f3. That to me looks a pretty solid way. And after knight h6, just centralised with rook a d1. If knight g4, queen g2, no hassle. And if black doesn't play knight g4, white is very well placed in the center. Very well placed to react to anything that black does. Essentially, white's going to advance the central pawns at some convenient moment. b4, black plays knight h6 again, and now f3. Just keeping the knight out of g4, getting ready to defend the second rank with moves like queen to e2 or rook to f2 if necessary. Black lurches forward. White blocks, and now black lurches forward once more with b5. I don't know what Mike Basman had for breakfast that day, but um, it must have approximated to rocket fuel the way he's playing in this game. Because once again, he rejects the opportunity to play a move like e5. Of course, that does allow the, the knight into e6. But here, you know, having played so provocatively, I think black should just snap off that pawn and take the medicine. Got a bad position, but... Uh, at least he's a, a pawn up. Don't know, you know, you begin to wonder how is the black queen getting out of here? But uh, White's well, still got to prove it. Perhaps he could start with the move. Bishop takes g5, I don't know. Anyway, I think you'll agree for British Championship final playoff, this is a pretty bizarre situation. Anyway, Basman plays b5. And Hartston now moves in with an excellent idea. Knight takes c6. 
very strong. Black takes the knight. Queen to a4 is white's point. King goes to f7 only move, I think, in view of the discovered check. And now white regains his sacrifice material with queen takes a6. It's all a question of now of whether black can gain any sort of attack whatsoever by playing knight takes g4. I mean, that really is black's last chance. With his queen walled up, somehow black's got to get that queen out. So he takes on g4. White takes on c4 check. A very useful intermezzo. And after king g7, again, very cold-blooded, Hartston takes on g4. Letting the black queen out, yes, but then saying to black, well, where's your development? I'm going to pulverise you with my superior development. And that's exactly what happens after h3, another lurch, knight to e5. An absolutely crushing move um, with the simple idea of queen to f7 check. Black played king h7, he could see no better. In came the queen, bishop g7, and now rook to f3. The triumph of white's strategical play and a re-emphasis that virtually everything black's done in this game has been unsound. So with this fine victory, Hartston moved into a 2-1 lead in the playoff match. Eventually won by him by 4 and a half to one and a half. As you can see in the final position, uh, Black's got to surrender his queen. So there we are, um, an entertaining selection of four games from recent British Championships, apart from the 1910 version, of course, and I hope you enjoyed them. Do join us over the next couple of weeks for more British Championship action from Warwick on the ECF YouTube channel.